Good morning and uh, welcome to the meeting of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm Council Member uh, Francisco Moya, the Chairperson of the Subcommittee. Uh, and today we are joined by Council Members Rivera and Council Member Ku. Uh, if you are here to testify, please fill out a speaker slip uh, with the Sergeant at Arms indicating your full name and application name or LU number you wish to testify on. Uh, I would like to first note that we will be laying over uh, LU number 419, the Court Square Block 3 text amendment. Uh, our first hearing is on LU 438, an application by Center Boulevard Restaurant LLC, uh, American Brass, for the new revocable consent for an unenclosed sidewalk cafe located at uh, 201 50th Avenue in Queens in Council Member Van Bramer's district. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application. And I'd like to call up Robert Callahan and Robert Briskin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Council, uh, please swear in the panel. Please state your name uh, as part of your response. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and I that you will answer all questions truthfully? I do. I do. Please state your name for the record. Robert Briskin. Uh, Mr. Chairman, at this time, I'd like to read um, a letter of agreement that uh, was sent to uh, Council Member Van Bramer's office on June 18th. Uh, 2019. Uh, dear Honorable Chair Moya and Council Member Van Bramer, please accept this letter as confirmation of our agreement with you. As per our agreement with Community Board 2 of Queens on 6-20-2019, the sidewalk cafe seating on New York City property will be reduced from 24 tables and 86 seats to 12 tables and 48 seats. The hours of operation will be 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. Sunday to Thursday and 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. on Friday and Saturday. These are the hours agreed to with the community board at the hearing. We did not propose later hours. The new plans and compliance checklist showing 12 tables and 48 seats has already been submitted to the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs. We will store all the sidewalk cafe furniture against the restaurant facade on our private property at night. If anything else is required, please contact my representative, Michael Kelly, at 914-740-3580. Sincerely, Robert Briskin, member. Uh, that's your, your testimony for today? Yes. That's what you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other members of the public uh, who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application. Uh, we will now turn our public hearings to our next hearing. Uh, which is on LU number 470 for the 76 Drive and Austin Street rezoning uh, for property in Council Member Kozlowitz's district in Queens. Uh, the, ap the applicant seeks approval of a zoning map amendment to rezone an existing uh, R2 zoning district in the neighborhood of Forest Hills as an R32 district. The proposed action would facilitate the legalization and expansion of use group four medical offices within existing buildings located at 111-04-76 uh, Drive and 11103-77th Avenue. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application and I'd like to call up uh, Richard Lobel and uh, David Rosenberg. Thank you. Uh, Council, if you could please swear in the panel. Please state your full name as part of your response. Do you swear uh, or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you will answer all questions truthfully? Richard Lobel, I do. David Rosenberg, I do. Thank you. You may begin. Good morning, Chair, Council Members, 
Again, Richard Lobel from Sheldon Lobel, joined by David Rosenberg, and we're here today to discuss the Austin Street rezoning. So as you can see from the circled area on the map, this uh, district is currently zoned R2 and is bordered on the west and south by an existing R6 district. The district was rezoned in around 2000 as part of the QFARS rezoning. And as you can see from the highlighted area on the tax map, the zoning district that is sought is an R32. Uh, very simply, what this would do would be to allow existing non-conforming medical office located within both lot one and lot 61 as part of the rezoned area to become conforming uses under the R32. You can see the land use in the area reflects both uh, larger density R6 buildings to the west and south, as well as to the uh, more single family character of the area to the north and east. Uh, the area is also encumbered by restrictive covenants so that on this block within the R2 district and within the R th proposed R32, uh, there would be no multifamily buildings allowed. This is pursuant to longstanding restrictive covenants. So the medical office that's existing there amounts to uh, roughly 1,600 square feet in each of the two buildings. Uh, the community board was very much in favor of this, voted 34 to two in favor. That was community board six in Queens. And this uh, approval was again issued by the Queensboro president as well as the city planning commission. The R32 here is seen as appropriate uh, for two reasons. The first is that this will allow the uh, conforming use at the property from an existing non-conforming doctor's office, so it will allow this to become conforming, as well as the fact that it serves as a decent buffer between the lower density R2 and the higher density R6 to the south and west. I'd also note, of course, that with regards to the zoning calculations, and we throw the table up on the screen right now, there are no basic bulk differences between the R2 and the R32. So the 0.5 FAR for residential remains the same. The one FAR for community facility remains the same. Really, other than slight variations in height and setback, uh, the major difference here is for us as medical office as the R2 does not permit uh, doctor's offices and the R32 does. So as was discussed fully with the community board, this is really a, uh, a rezoning to allow for an expansion of this uh, single non-conforming use. And we'd be happy to answer any questions regarding uh, our presentation. Thank you, just uh, one quick question. Uh, are there any plan changes to parking on the site? Uh, there, there's an existing parking area between the buildings. Uh, this is going to be improved as part of the uh, as of right requirements in the R32, so there's additional planting that will be asked for and some curb cut adjustment will be made. Uh, this was uh, uh, detailed in a letter to city planning which has been submitted to the council as well. Okay, uh, and is there any other development expected on the site due to the rezoning? No, there is none. The, uh, the, Real advantage to the applicant here is that they'll be able to expand within these existing buildings. Uh, right now, they can't even allow for back office space to occupy any additional square footage without allowing for a change in the zoning district. So uh, we've gotten a, gotten a really good response. The doctor here, Dr. Manuel, is a, a, a valued local uh, surgeon. He's an orthopedic surgeon. He's got a wonderful practice and it works closely with several local hospitals. So everyone's been really positive about the rezoning. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Good seeing you. Thank you. Uh, are, are there any other members of the public uh, who wish to testify uh, on this item? Uh, seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing on this application, uh, and it will be laid over. Uh, our next hearing is on LU number uh, 469 for the 38-01 23rd Avenue rezoning for property in Councilmember Constantinidis' district in Queens. The applicant seeks approval for a zoning map amendment uh, to map a C23 commercial overlay district along 23rd uh, Avenue between 38th Street and Sineway Street. Uh, this action would allow the applicant to seek special permits for physical cultural establishment use from the Board of Standards and Appeals for the purpose of legalizing a gym and a yoga studio within the existing building as well as to allow for future use uh, consistent with the proposed C2 district uh, regulations. The City Planning Commission voted to modify the proposal by removing from the rezoning area the portion of the C23 overlay uh, beyond 100 feet north of 23rd Avenue and within 75 feet of Steinway Street. 
Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application, and we'd like to call up uh, Rachel Skull and Tal uh, Macaluso. Thank you. Uh, Council, if you could please swear in the panel. Please state your name as part of your response. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Todd Macaluso. Yes, I do. Rachel Skull, I do. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Rachel Skull. I'm an associate with Greenberg Charg. We represent 23rd Avenue Realty LLC, the applicant seeking a rezoning to map a C23 commercial overlay to a depth of 150 feet from the north side of 23rd Avenue and 125 feet from the east side of 38th Street and to a depth of 100 feet from the north side of 23rd Avenue and, and 75 feet west, from the west side of Steinway Street. And Todd McAlusa is here on behalf of the applicant to help answer any questions. Currently, the, re the portion of the rezoning area within 100 feet of the northern side of 23rd Avenue and within 100 feet of the western side of Steinway Street is in an R5D zoning district, and the remainder of the rezoning area is in an R5B residential zoning district. The proposed rezoning would not change the underlying districts which were put in place as part of the 2010 Astoria rezoning. Our client owns 3801 23rd Avenue, uh, lot one outlined in red on this slide. It's an approximately 17,000 square foot lot, improved with a four story, 50 foot tall loft building uh, with a one story interior portion. The building, which you see here, was constructed in 1912 as part of the Astoria Silkworks complex, which formerly took up this block. It contains approximately 48,700 square feet of floor area. The uses in the building have been legal non-conforming since the enactment of the 1961 zoning resolution, and the building is legal non-complying with, with respect to bulk and is overbuilt by about 19,000 square feet. Can Today, I just, the building- I'm sorry, can I just ask you to uh, move the microphone a little closer? I, I, sorry. Okay, yeah, thank you. Today, the building contains a mix of residential and commercial uses, including offices, music rehearsal and production space, acupuncture, tattoo artist, a CrossFit gym, and a yoga studio. It's a bit of a local office park in there. The rezoning area also encompasses lot 61 and 64. Lot 61 is uh, improved with a two-story mixed-use building housing an auto body shop, building supply, and residential uses. Um, and then lot, sorry, and that's, so that's the black and yellow auto body entrance you see right there, as well as the building on the right in this photo. And then lot 64 is improved with a three-story mixed-use building uh, on the left there, housing a residential uses in a cafe with this garage along 23rd Avenue. There is no development or enlargement proposed with this rezoning. Rather, the rezoning will align the the zoning in the area with the primarily non-residential character, character of this portion of the block will allow for the orderly and lawful transition of uses in the future. It will also allow the yoga studio, studio and CrossFit gym within this building to seek physical culture establishment special permits from the Board of Standards and Appeals. Um, and the reason that we are seeking this rezoning now is that several years ago, uh, my clients started re receiving a little bit of attention from the Department of Buildings um, and when he went to correct his CO to, to legalize uses within the building, um, we discovered that back in the early 1970s, a neighbor had erroneously filed documents at the Department of Buildings claiming that his lot was merged with my client's lot. Took a few years to undo all of that. Now we are seeking this rezoning, which will allow those two uh, the yoga studio and CrossFit gym to seek those two PCE special permits, which in turn will allow uh, my client to update the CO for his building and have everything in order. And we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, just two quick questions, and I'm not sure if you said this, I might not have heard it, but has this building always been uh, included in the non-conforming uh, use? Right, so it's been, the uses have been non-conforming since the 1961 zoning resolution went into place. Okay. And is there any planned development expected on the site or the adjacent site as a result of the rezoning? There's no development expected. That's it, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you for your testimony.
Are there any other members of the public uh, who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing uh, on this application and it will be laid over. Our next hearing is on LU number uh, 466 for the 115 West 18th uh, Street Garage Special Permit for property in Council, uh, in Council Speaker Johnson's district in Manhattan. The applicant seeks approval for a special permit to allow a 180 space uh, attended uh, accessory parking garage within a future as of right mixed use development to be located at 115 West 18th Street, which is in the special West Chelsea District, and also within a C62 zoning district. The development would include approximately 181 dwelling units, approximately 18,000 square feet of retail space, uh, absent the special permit, approximately 41 uh, accessory parking spaces located at the seller level. Uh, I note that the application has been modified since it was certified and began the public process review. Uh, prior to City Planning Commission's vote, the applicant modified its application by, among other changes, reducing the total amount of requested spaces from uh, 180 to 110, adding new public bicycle spaces and reducing the number of proposed uh, parking stackers. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application and we call up Ethel Goodman. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Rubin. Aye. Seth Wright. Aye. Uh, and Council, can you please swear in the panel? Please state your full name for the, uh, as part of your response. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth? and nothing but the truth and that you will answer all questions truthfully. Ethan Goodman, I do. Uh, Seth Wright, I do. Betty McIntosh. And Jeff Rubin, I do. Ms. McIntosh, sorry, if you could fill out a speaker card and submit it to the Sergeant at Arms. Can you fill out, we need you to fill out one of these if you could. Are, are you talking to me? Yes. Yes, I filled one out, I gave it to the officer. Sorry, it was uh, marked incorrectly. Oh, got it. So, uh, Ms. McIntosh, we will bring you up at, at the next pa uh, panel. These are the uh, presenters for the proposal, and then we'll bring you and any other member of the public that is testifying uh, in support or in opposition uh, right after. Okay. Uh, I also want to tell folks, please wait until we call your name before coming up to the panel uh, so we can avoid uh, the confusion. Thank you. Okay, uh, good morning, uh, Chair Moore, Council Members. Uh, thank you for having us today. Um, my name is Ethan Goodman. I'm with the firm of Fox Rothschild, and we represent the applicant for uh, a accessory parking garage at 515 West 18th Street. Um, the site is located on the corner of 10th Avenue and West 18th Street and extends to West 19th Street in places as well. Currently, there's a 181-unit building under construction. Um, zoning permits a 41-space accessory parking garage here as of right. Um, and by way of background, the site was uh, substantially excavated to remediate uh, contaminated soils pursuant to a New York State Brownfields cleanup program. Uh, as a result, this uh, resulted in a substantial amount of removal of soils and excavation, uh, which left us with an approximately 36,000 square foot excavated cellar space that needed to be programmed. Um, because the floodplain here is fairly high, it makes the cellar uh, unusable for a lot of uses, retail and amenity, and we determined that parking was really the, the, the most viable and appropriate use of the cellar. Um, so pursuant to the special permit we're applying under, uh, there are certain quantitative findings that have been established uh, to ensure that the number of spaces you're requesting is appropriate. Um, and one of those is looking at the neighborhood vicinity and how many parking spaces have been developed in the past 10 years versus the number of residential units that have been developed. Um, this is somewhat different than the regulations that were in place before the special permit was passed with the intention that some of these special permits were intended to serve not necessarily just the building, but also the larger neighborhood, given that some of those buildings would not build their own parking. 
Um, and so we looked at that, and I'm joined with, by, um, by Jeff Rubin and Philip Habib and Associates that did the parking demand study. And we determined in the past 10 years, in, a, in, a, um, in an approximately seven block radius, there were over 2,000 new residential buildings that were developed, yet only a net increase of about 77 residential parking spaces. Um, this translates to a 4% residential parking growth ratio, and the special permit allows for the application of spaces to fill up to a 20% uh, target for the neighborhood. Um, so so uh, it's currently substantially below that. And what's happened in the last 10 years in the neighborhood is that uh, these units, a lot of these units are in buildings that built no parking whatsoever. And so we saw at least about 20 buildings constructed with over 500 dwelling units that had no parking. Um, and that means that new residents uh, that, that generally uh, own cars at a ratio of about one to four um, brought over 500 additional cars into the neighborhood in the past 10 years. And so our initial application uh, requested an increase of 141 spaces over the as of right 41 spaces. I'm sorry, the math is off, 139 spaces. Um, and that would result in 180 space overall garage. That would increase the ratio to 8%, which is still well below the 20% uh, ratio that's permitted. Um, the community board, as well as the borough president and city planning commission did raise concerns on a couple of fronts. Um, one of which is, seems to be an ongoing concern about the, the findings for this special permit, which talks about neighborhood parking um, and not just parking for the building to which it's accessory. Um, and if you look at just the building, the way the numbers worked out, although this wasn't intentional, we have 181 space um, building and 180 space uh, parking facility. So some saw that as essentially a one-to-one -one ratio of spaces to people, to units in the building, which was not intended. Um, so in response to these concerns, uh, what we did is we reduced the request by more than 50%. Um, and the request is now to add 69 additional spaces to have 110 total. Um, we did that by uh, removing substantial number of stackers in the cellar space, by converting some space to residential storage, and also by responding to another concern of the borough president and city planning commission, which is to provide affordable bike parking. Uh, we've provided uh, 20 bike parking spaces for the public in this garage. Um, we've committed to affordable pricing of about $5 a day for these. And um, these are uh, over and above the accessory bike parking spaces that would be in the first floor of the building for building residents. Um, and, and this reduction, there's a logic here. And what this reduction does is it links the number of spaces more closely to the demand from the building to which it's accessory. Um, we've got a building here with a lot of big units. Um, and based on census data that, that we've put together, uh, the building's estimated to generate a demand for about 115 spaces. Uh, so we've reduced the number to uh, a number less than that, which is 110 spaces well within the demand uh, that'll be generated for the building. Um, so again, the building is, is no longer intended to house uh, cars from necessarily from outside the neighborhood or from even outside buildings in the neighborhood or transients. It's really focused just on the residents of the building. Um, and so there are other findings which are qualitative for the special permit, and that's uh, how will this affect the functioning of the street. Uh, we want to be clear, um, right now there are about five curb cuts on the north side of the street. Uh, this building and the parking garage will reduce that to one curb cut. That curb cut is located mid-block, very far from the intersections of both the Westside Highway, 11th, 11th Avenue, and the High Line Stairs, or 10th Avenue to the east. Um, the size of the garage, our, our um, our uh, traffic analysis indicates that relatively few cars will enter and exit in a peak hour, um, and there are relatively few peak hour pedestrians or bicycles that go down this street too. So we think it's well situated um, and very safe as far as the neighborhood goes. Um, that summarizes our formal presentation. Uh, my colleagues from uh, uh, Philip Habib and Associates are here with respect to any questions you have on the environmental review or the layout of the garage. Thank you. Uh, can we just go back to the number of uh, parking spaces. So the, the borough president recommended that it be reduced to 100. You modified it to 110. Why did you only bring down the number of spaces to 110 and not 100? Right, right. We wanted to make sure our, mod our, our modification was, was rooted in, a, in, in, in sort of something that not just an arbitrary modification, it was, was rooted in methodology that would tie it closely to the demand from the building. Um, and we, we really pulled census data on the demand for the building and got to a number that's, that's closer to about 110. Uh, there is a second component here also, and that's that another recommendation of the borough presidents was that we employ, um, uh, we, we try to get in a car share service. She, I think she's a car share or car the, rental. Right. We'd still like to do that. 
Um, we know car share services, um, while the zoning permits up to 20% of the garage to be used for car share, um, typically car share services such as Zipcar and others don't really want as, that, as many spaces as that. Um, they usually want closer to maybe six or eight or 10 spaces. So we wanted to give a little bit of room, even above the 100, to be able to continue to pursue car share for this garage, mm -hmm. although we can't commit to that today because we don't have a deal with a car sharing service, um, but there is a little buffer in there for that. So go back to your methodology right. for coming up with this. You said you did a census study? But that's right. And can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So census data um, is basically provides, there are some cross tabs on census data and they've got a subset of data from the American Community Survey that basically assesses availability of vehicles to people who live in census tracts. So we looked at the immediately surrounding census tracts and we looked at, um, we basically, I'll go back to the, the page that shows it. Mm -hmm. um, this 181 unit building, uh, while overall census tracts in the area have generally a ratio of between 26 and 35% car ownership, our units are very, very heavily weighted towards large units that would house families, and census data really shows as the number of people in the household increases, the percentage of car ownership increases substantially as well, and so we cross-tabbed it with both size of units and also generally household incomes. Slightly more affluent incomes tend to have car ownership at a higher level too, and so processing that data together um, with this particular building, not just applying a generic number to the neighborhood, really gets you to a number that, at really a conservative number of 115. It, it could likely be higher than that, but that's a conservative number. Okay, uh, thank you. And are there any, um, or I should say, what other as of right uses did you consider for this space and uh, why weren't they viable? So there are not a lot of as of right uses you can put in here because of the flood regulations uh, without essentially dry flood proofing this, this entire area and having it in a bathtub. Um, you can put in certain amount of residential storage, non-active uses. Uh, we couldn't put in a residential amenity space. Um, you could put in some retail uses, but they'd really have to be limited to more retail storage uses. Active retailing spaces are held to a higher standard as well, so that was difficult. Um, there's also a leasing difficulty with seller retail space in the area as well. Um, and so, um, you know, initially looking at also what's happened in the past, in the neighborhood in the past 10 years, there really seemed to be a lot of people bringing cars into the neighborhood, so it really seemed to be a, um, a, a use that was in high demand. Um, and so we went with parking, and we, we think it would be very difficult to occupy the space with too much more use as far as residential storage that would actually be utilized. <coughs> Okay, thank you. thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, I'd now like to call up uh, Betty McIntosh. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Betty McIntosh. I am the co-chair. Can, can you just make sure that the microphone is turned on? There you go. How's that? Better? That's perfect. Okay. Thank you. I'm still Betty McIntosh. <laughs> I am co-chair of the Manhattan Community Board for Chelsea Land Use Committee. As stated in our March 14th letter, the board recommends that the application for the special permit for additional accessory parking at 551 West 18th Street be denied. We believe that the number of proposed accessory parking spaces should be restricted to those available as of right 36 accessory parking spaces for the 181 residential units and five for the commercial space. Uh, certainly the City Planning Commission's reduction to 110 spaces is in the right direction. That is 69 spaces more than what would be permitted as of right. The additional parking, we believe, would negatively impact the neighborhood character. 
The subject building is in, in the center of tourist destinations between High Line Park, the Hudson River Park, and Chelsea Piers. Art galleries and the Whitney Museum are nearby. The existing lands streetscape is not car-oriented. Thousands of visitors come to see these attractions and walk from nearby public transit or bike or ride bicycles. The board is concerned about the increasing traffic created by new residential developments in West Chelsea. For example, just south of the subject site, construction is to be completed in 2020 for two interconnected towers with 236 apartments and a 137-room hotel. There will be driveways entering mid-block on West 17th Street and 18th Streets for that project. Additional cars will create pedestrian safety issues already in this area. From May 2015 to May 2019, there were 38 injuries for bikes, bike riders, pedestrians, and motorists. And um, we are also concerned that the special permit uh, for more additional parking spaces, uh, that spaces would not be fully utilized. Uh, by the residents of this, uh, 515 West 18th Street. The Department of City Planning, now the applicant's data may be better, uh, stated that in 2015, the data for vehicle ownership in Manhattan Core indicates that vehicle ownership rate, rate was 23%. The rent, the, the rate for um, households earning $130,000 or more was 34%. And assuming that percent, about 62 parking spaces would be needed for the new uh, 181 uh, apartments. And the applicant has stated that if all the parking spaces are not used by the residents, the remaining spaces would be rented to non-residents. This would re could result in transient parking, which we oppose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank okay. you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify uh, on this uh, item? Seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. Our next hearing is on LU's number uh, 464 and 465 for the Kisena uh, Center rezoning for property and council member Coos District in Queens, the applicant sought approval for a, uh, a zoning map amendment to rezone an existing R32 district to R7A and R7A C23 districts, uh, as well as a related zoning text amendment to establish a manager inclusionary housing area with MIH option two. Uh, as proposed, these actions would have uh, facilitated the development of an eight-story mixed-use building containing approximately 59,000 square feet of ground floor retail, approximately 15,000 square feet of community facility and residential uh, amenity space uh, on the second floor, and approximately 235,000 square feet of residential use, or approximately 244 dwelling units uh, on floors three through eight. Uh, the City Planning Commission voted to modify the proposal to change the proposed uh, R7A C23 zoning district to an R6A C23 district. The Commission also modified the application to reduce the zoning boundary lines from a distance originally ending at Labram Avenue to the distance of 365 feet uh, southeasterly of Holly Avenue. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application and I'd like to call up uh, Jody Stein. Uh, Nicholas Brown and John Clifford. Oh, yes. And, and before we swear in the panel, uh, I would just like to turn it over to Council Member Ku uh, for his remarks. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Chair yeah. Hello everyone, yeah, welcome to City Hall. And I believe many of you, this is the first time you're here. 
and also the first public hearing you attend. And we also want, want to welcome uh, a newborn, uh, well, newborn baby, a baby here too. <laughs> this is her first time uh, in the city government building. Mm. Uh, I'm Councilmember Ku. Uh, we're here to, to uh, we're here today to discuss the rezoning of the 46-15 Kisena Boulevard um, by uh, Kim Ko Realty, who proposed to upzone the property to R6A with a C2-3 overlay. This location at Holly Avenue and Kisena Boulevard is a dividing line between high density downtown flushing and the low density neighborhood of Kisena, Bolo, uh, Kisena Park. On the north side of Holly, we have a seven story building, so I can certainly see why one might think the south side of Holly could have a similar scale. My issue with this project is that while the location may serve as the gateway to downtown Flushing, the other side is low, low density residential homes a few stories high. We rezoned Kisena Park in 2005 in an attempt to keep the area's residential charm. We have to draw the line somewhere, but if we keep moving the goal poses, Eventually we, will, uh, we eventually, we will run out of fuel. I do worry about this. We set a precedent by extending downtown Flushing's footprint past Harley. We encourage contextual development in Flushing, and I commend the developer for meeting the civics and the residents of the community board and for continuing making adjustments along the way. So we would like to hear from the public on this project. I want everyone for coming out today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Ku. Uh, Council, if you could please swear in the panel. Please state your full name as part of your response. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and you'll answer all questions truthfully. Jody Stein, I do. John Clifford, I do. Nick Brown, I do. Thank you. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. Good morning, council members. Um, this project, uh, uh, we hope to, for Casino Boulevard, we hope to be responsive to the community and the council members' concerns. Uh, my name is Jody Stein. I'm land use counsel from Herrick Feinstein. Um, sitting to my left is John Clifford from S9 Architecture, and to my right is the applicant, Nick Brown from Kimco. I'd like to just turn it over to Nick Brown for a few minutes um, to talk about uh, the property and Kimco in general. Good morning to the chair and council members. Thank you for your time um, today. We appreciate it. Thought it'd be helpful just to start off with a few quick words about who Kimco is as a company. Um, had the opportunity to, to meet many of you, and some of you are familiar with Kimco, but for those of you who aren't, thought it'd be helpful to give a little bit of context. Kimco has been in business for over 60 years. Um, we are owners and operators of shopping center properties and mixed-use properties throughout the country. Um, we own over 400 properties, and although we do have a national footprint, we are very much a local company as well. We are headquartered about 15 minutes east of the subject property that we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, from a general standpoint, our strategy as an owner is always to take a look at our existing properties and figure out how can we make them better? How can we improve upon them from what they are today? And throughout that process, we're always looking from a general standpoint to try to create an environment that's more vibrant, that's clean, upscale, something that's more modern, and a place that creates a cohesive sense of community a place where people can live, they can shop, and they can work there as well. Um, what we found is that historically this has been a mutually beneficial strategy, not just for Kimco as far as our objectives, um, but what this does is it also benefits the surrounding community, it benefits the residents, and it benefits the local businesses as well. One other important point to note is that Kimco 
um, from, a, from a strategy is also a long-term holder of our properties. That's especially true for properties that are located in large markets like New York City. There are many properties that we've held for 30, 40, 50 some odd years. And the reason why I think that's important to mention today is, as you'll hear, um, as, as Jody and, and John get into it a little bit further, um, is that when we look to design this property, we need to make sure that it makes sense, not just for day one, that's the perspective of someone who's looking to sell out of a property. They want to build it, develop it, and flip it. For us, we want to hold it long term. It needs to um, be a site that is appropriately designed, it's convenient for the shoppers, and it satisfies the needs of the community. So I think you'll hear um, some of how we approach that today. As far as this specific site, this is a property that we have purchased roughly 10 years ago, and um, we've held it since. We haven't had an opportunity until today to redevelop the site because of the existing lease terms. Um, but now that those leases are expiring, we have this opportunity in front of us to move forward with the project that you'll hear about. And when we sat down and worked with, with John and his design team, um, we challenged them with a few different objectives. And the first thing that we looked to and asked um, John and his architecture team to, to try to address were some significant design flaws that existed on day one when Kimco acquired the property. Um, we looked at the site and we recognized, and these are some of the themes that Jody will speak to a little further, but um, first and foremost, the access to the site does not work very well as far as cars pulling into the property. Not easy to get in and out, and what that does is it tends to create a traffic backlog out onto Casino Boulevard. So we came up with what we think is a pretty good solution to address that access issue. We also recognize that um, from a pedestrian standpoint, people trying to access the storefronts from the sidewalks, not always easy to do. You're trying to navigate between cars pulling in, cars parking, trucks moving around. So we realize that there's an opportunity there to make this a much more welcoming environment for the pedestrians and people looking to get into the site by foot. And then finally, um, we also recognized, and part of this came from talking to the local neighbors here, that there's a real incompatibility that exists in terms of the rear of the shopping center and the residents that directly abut it. The issue is that the back of house, the, the loading with the trucks and the, and the sounds, the smells from the garbage and everything else that goes along with having a grocery store that abuts residences, um, it's not compatible as, as hard as we try to work with the operator to clean that up there will always be issues there until we move forward with the solution, which we think is a pretty elegant one as far as pushing all of those uses down underground and eliminating them from the rear of those residents. So those are some of the themes that Jody's gonna speak to a little bit further and John as well. Um, again, thank you for your time this morning and with that, I'll turn it over to them. So good morning. As we look at our first slide and we look at the project site, um, along Casino Boulevard, you'll see to the north, 45th Avenue. Um, in between 45th Avenue, the project, um, and Holly Avenue, the project starts for the boundary line, um, and it goes to almost the middle um, of Holly to Laburnum, um, and you'll see the casino is a north-south bound traffic um, road. Um, as we go on to the next, you'll see when we were originally certified with our plan and we were working with city planning for approximately three years on coming up with a, a proposal for this rezoning area, um, we started um, uh, with city planning at an R7A. Um, after speaking with the community um, and many different uh, land use meetings at the community board, um, and the community board meeting and the borough president meeting, we have reduced the size of the rezoning area to remove the lot that's at the corner of Laburnum and Casino Boulevard, um, which was a problematic uh, uh, property according to uh, the community board. And we also um, went from an R7A to an R6A. So the commercial overlay remained the same, but we downzoned ourselves based on community input. And, and made the rezoning area smaller. Um, this is a view looking north on Casina. Um, you can see the shopping center, uh, the, the uh, blue and orange shopping center that currently exists. You can see the cars in the parking lot um, and the pedestrian walkway. Um, 
that people have to cross through and through the parking lot to get to the supermarket site. Um, you will also see, as you look north on Casina, um, there, and part of the rezoning area, there is a five-story and seven-story building that will come into compliance with this rezoning, and that is just north of Holly Avenue. Um, and past the rezoning area, which you can also see, there is a 12-story and eight-story building on the same block south of 45th Avenue um, that, that also exists, and you can see in that picture. If you look at the existing site again, you can see what Nick was referring to in his testimony where the parking lot um, comes up against Casino Boulevard and, and pedestrians have to cross through that and traffic um, is queuing into those two um, egress and entrances along Casino Boulevard. Um, and then you can also see what Nick was referring to when he talked about the traffic and the loading abutting the rear residences, both on the sides and in the rear, um, which is just not the, the best situation um, for, the, for the residences and for our neighbors. Um, when we started out this project again, we started out being certified as an R7A with an eight-story building, and you can see that rendering on the left. You can also see um, the proposed development sites, both to the, to the south and to the north of um, the project site. Um, and then when we downzoned to an R6A ourselves and also shortened the rezoning area, the lot to the south came out of the development site. We ended up with a six story, sorry, a seven story building. Um, and you can see that, that that carries north, the R6A. Um, what we've recently um, proposed to the councilman, uh, who you know we heard was still unhappy, and when we met with the civics and the community board, you know we heard them loud and clear, um, and took it very seriously um, as being part of a neighbor in the neighborhood. And we've come to um, down further. Uh, we so we remain the same in the R6A district, but we will restrict our building. Um, to a five-story building, both along Casina and in the rear, as you'll see when John points it out to you. This, it gives a nice transition as well from the um, buildings across Holly North uh, down to, to this area. Good morning. The plan before you is a site and roof plan where we are showing the changes that we've made in the many meetings that we've had with uh, members of the community and the community board. Um, they're highlighted on the plan and in the section. So first and foremost, the original application had a building height of 95 feet that through the different iterations that Jody just showed, we are now down to a five-story building of 65 feet in height, a reduction of about a third in height. We've decreased the density by 53% and the number of residential units proposed from 244 to 114. We've increased setbacks both in the rear and south side that are not required by zoning to a minimum of eight feet and are showing that that will be provided via restrictive declaration. We've increased the residential rear yard accordingly from a required 30 feet to an increase of 45 feet on the north side of the property. We've also uh, located the towers particularly on the north side so that we could increase the rear yards of the Holly residence to increase the distance of the five-story tower from 30 feet to 65 feet uh, shown over here. This slide shows the different iterations of how we've worked with the community in our many meetings to uh, reduce the impact that they perceived, particularly in terms of, of density and height. So the left-hand column shows the original application of R7A, then a reduction to R6A, then a reduction R6A where we reduced the stories even further, and finally what we are here for today is the five-story R6A. So what you can see on the far right column is the reduction in these uses. Um, in terms of FAR from what's permitted in the original application to a 4.6, that now we're down to a 3.6, a reduction of 22%. Uh, 
um, for the t total FAR, we've gone from an R7A of 4.49 down to 2.71 with this five-story building. For the zoning floor area, uh, particularly in the residential, we've reduced the residential zoning floor area by 50%. The number of units reduced accordingly uh, from 244 to 114 units. The parking, however, was a concern for the neighborhood. Um, we are providing about 230% more parking than it would be required by zoning, and we took a very conservative approach for, in that calculation, we also took a very conservative approach for the commercial parking using the most stringent use group parking requirement and applying that to the overall commercial footprint. Just going through the floor plans because it alludes to some of the things and we'll show you some existing condi conditions that Jody and Nick um, described earlier. So the ground floor is on the upper right, commercial with the residential lobby and the community facility lobby. And you can see that there is a long driveway that goes down to the cellar where the parking and all the servicing will be contained. You can see that in two levels of underground parking at the bottom of the page. Uh, we worked with our traffic engineers listening to the community about the problem with stacking and backing up onto Casino Boulevard and we feel this will uh, eliminate all of that and again as Nick had said earlier it moves all of the um, servicing and rubbish removal and things like that for the entire block below grade and away from the homes both to the north and to um, on Union Street. Uh, on the upper left the second floor shows the community facility in the lavender color and then the residential towers with their modified and enhanced setbacks in response to uh, community concerns and discussions. So as Nick mentioned before, um, the existing site which was developed a long time ago um, has some inherent problems in terms to adjacency with the residential uh, on both the north and the east. Um, in the rear, right up against the property line in that bottom left photograph, those are the rear yards of the homes on Union. And you can see that the ventilation, the rubbish dumpsters, trucks, and so forth, and security lights are all in the backyards. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see where that also affects the rear yards of the people on Holly. Their fence is to the right, right there. Um, and you can see the existing section on the top that it literally has the trucks and dumpsters right behind a six or eight foot high fence on the rear property line. This will all be moved underground uh, so there'll be no noise, light, or odor that would affect um, the adjoining residences. And then we've been working with members of the community immediately adjacent and how that treatment can be done because their yards abut. We're providing an eight foot additional setback from the property line uh, above what's required that we're going to work to see how they want to have it treated with landscaping, fencing, and architectural treatment or green walls on the podium of the building uh, near the zoning district line. Finally, for traffic, which was a significant concern when we first started meeting uh, with the community, we worked with VHB, our traffic engineer, as well as uh, local information provided by residents of the community. So as you saw earlier in the existing slide, there are two existing curb cuts onto Casino with no throat um, for stacking as cars enter and exit the parking facility. We are eliminating one of those curb cuts up at Juniper and adding an on-street parking space, which is also a concern of the community. And then having only one entry into the new development at a new signal at Calmia uh, with that long throat that brings uh, all of the parking and service down into the cellar. So both inbound and outbound have uh, about 300 feet of stacking in both directions. The other thing that that does is Calmia currently has a pedestrian crosswalk across Casino, but no control for the pedestrian crossing. Uh, this signal will allow a safe crossing of Casino. And of course, we're adding another crosswalk on the south side of Casina. Uh, as you head north on Casina on the Laburnum side, 
we are adding a right turn only lane uh, between Laburnum and the new signal so that there will not be uh, any um, stacking caused by turning vehicles going into the project from the south. And then additionally, coming from the north, we are uh, eliminating a few on-street parking spaces so that we can create a dedicated left turn lane so that southbound traffic can move freely and won't be hindered by turning vehicles, which exist now in this corridor uh, between Holly and Laburnum. So that's what we wanted to eliminate. And this, again, was um, based on many conversations with members of the community. And concurrently, we've been working with DOT. Uh, DOT seems to be very much in favor of this, and both conversations are ongoing. So the changes that we've made were in response to many meetings with the community board, many hours that we put in, in bulk, the bulk height, setback, the number of off-street parking spaces, the actual rezoning area, the reduction of the rezoning area, and traffic, which we really, um, you know, as analyzed, should be better after the project is built with these changes that we work through with the community, which go above and beyond the typical mitigation measures that are required um, in, a, in a typical Euler uh, process. Um, and working with the council member, the local council member, Council Member Koo, um, you know, we, it's been extremely helpful to um, hear from him and reiterate the community's concerns, um, which we hope we were responsive enough to. Um, and the benefits for the neighborhood, which we hope that they see in the future, are the neighborhood investment, the job creation. Um, we hope to utilize that community facility space with something useful and great for the community. Um, the affordable housing, which we know is much needed. Uh, we've committed to a grocery store, um, to putting one back because we heard that that was a very important for the community. Um, we have improvements that, to the existing um, access and streetscape to get rid of that dangerous condition that exists now, and improvements to the rear yard conditions, which we hope will be beneficial for our um, neighboring residences. Um, we went around the community and we were able to get 1,100 signatures uh, from the local community. And these are just maps showing where those signatures came from in support of, of all the community members. And you can see on the right-hand side our project area and how close so many of these petitioners um, who signed the petition are to the actual project area. So we're so thankful for the support in the community. We hope that we've... Um, been responsive to the community board and the civic groups and the council member. And thank you very much. And I'd just like to add one, one final note in, in closing here. Um, this is just relating to the, the public review process and our engagement with the community throughout it. Um, although we did meet early on, this has been a, a long road getting here, as, as you know, a few years in the making, although we did meet with with Council Member Koo's office um, early on, as well as Community Board 7 leadership. I think we recognize today that in hindsight, we certainly could have done a better job in terms of keeping the lines of communication open with the stakeholders um, all the way up through to the certification process. Um, to the extent that we fell short in that regard, um, that's certainly on us as the owner. We take accountability and responsibility for that. Um, but I think it's also equally important to note what we've done since the Euler clock has started and the project got certified, all of the efforts that we've made that, that Jody outlined in terms of that extensive outreach, what we said at the Community Board 7 vote when that happened was that we still want to keep the communication open. We were true to our word, sitting down and meeting with the civics to try to bridge that gap. Um, and then even going further, responding to all the comments that we've seen through the different measures. And then um, even further, we also recognize the public process not everyone is always engaged, and there are certainly a lot of members of the community that the project impacts. We wanted to make sure that they were aware of the project, personally going door to door on more than one occasion with renderings, explanation of the project, so everyone is educated, understood what it was all about, had an opportunity to ask questions, and hearing, we were, we were um, delighted to hear that many of them did support the project. We went further beyond that sort of door to door walk by sending canvassers out into the um, streets of Flushing 
that was a period of two weeks, and as Jody mentioned, in, even within that short time frame, over a thousand uh, supporters, we were, we were very um, encouraged to see that as well. So I think that's sort of an important part of the history, and as we, as we move this forward, um, I also don't, do want to say in sitting down with the civics and listening to them, and we'll hear some of their concerns now shortly, we certainly are sympathetic to all of the issues that have been raised. As, where we are in this point of the project, what I think is really important is that in making up your mind and the decision about what, what to do with the rezoning in front of you, we look at this through a, a broader lens, if you will, um, and we examine the interests, not just of the people right in that immediate community, but throughout broader Flushing, throughout the broader borough, and throughout the city of New York, and we hope that you'll agree that based on the benefits that this project does um, provide in terms of local businesses coming into new retail spaces. We talked about that community facility space, which is a great opportunity in itself. We also talked about providing much needed housing and also providing a solution to the affordable housing crisis. And when you examine all those benefits, we hope that you will agree that this is a project that really is in best interest of, for the people of Flushing as well as the city. So with that, we thank you for your time and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, just a few questions before uh, I turn it over to uh, Council Member Koo. Uh, if we can just go back to uh, the traffic uh, issue. Can you just walk me through again the proposed uh, traffic mitigation in the conditional uh, negative declaration? Uh, and what other proposed mitigation strategies are you discussing with DOT? So the additional light is mm -hmm. part of the mitigation members that were in the CND, and there were mostly just changes to the timing on the light, um, like seconds of how the lights change. Um, that was most of the changes. We can have Alfred um, Young, who's here from DHB, answer that question more fully in case I missed anything, but I think that those were the, um, the changes within the, the CND, restricted declaration. Um. When do you plan on getting resolution on the other strategies with DOT? So we started the conversation in March um, and uh, just submitted something recently and hope to hear back soon on that. But some of the, you know, and they agreed to some of the daylighting, so removing some of the spots to allow for the turning lanes. The striping of turning lanes, I believe they'll want to see more when um, the project opens, but they'll allow for the room for the turning lanes to happen so traffic can move freely through and not block or queue, queue up. Again, I can have Alfred speak to more of uh, his conversations with DOT okay. specifically. Thank He'll you. testify. Um, also, so how do you respond to the community board's concerns that uh, people will uh, not use the underground parking uh, facility and will instead uh, use the public streets uh, to, to park. I, I could tackle that one. Um, you know, the, the, the access to, the, to this center, as far as the queuing, that was all very carefully designed. I think we all have a very aligned interest in that regard. Um, if, if the parking doesn't work, I mean, double parking is, is never a good solution. There's always a risk you can get ticketed as well. We know that doesn't stop some people from doing it. Um, but ultimately, the, the way that the parking works has to be convenient, it has to be easily accessible. And we were very careful as, in terms of creating um, enough room for people to maneuver and enough vertical transportation for people to get up from the um, parking garage up into the retail spaces and to do that seamlessly. It's certainly in our best interest to make sure that that's carefully designed um, based on other projects that we've had, which are very similar. We found that it does work and we've had success with it. Um, so that adds to our level of confidence. And, and do you plan to charge for parking on that site? We will not be charging um, for, the, for the retail access, no. Okay. Were you gonna say something? Yeah. Um, just if you look at this plan here, it's, it's a valid concern making underground parking as convenient as possible. Mm -hmm. So the commercial parking is right here, one story below the commercial that's up here. It's very simple, very intuitive parking layout, but we also have the vertical transportation right here that comes up so it can go directly into the grocery store. So again, most of the commercial traffic would be for grocery shopping and those people want to put their stuff right in their car. And we we were clear that we wanted to provide a direct and convenient access for that. 
it just, and further to, to John's point as well, um, you know, we do anticipate having some level of attended parking there too. So if there are people in, within the garage, um, it's always easier to use, whether it's a valet service or security measures to make sure that people are moving along um, and, and, and actually parking where they're supposed to and that there's no confusion for the shoppers. Got it. And how will the loading operate uh, on the site uh, for the commercial use? The loading it, on this, uh, the screen that's up now, mm -hmm. the trucks can come here and turn and you see this radius right here. They turn here and they do one maneuver back up into the loading docks right here and then there are freight elevators that bring it all up to the upstairs whether it's residential or, or retail and then they just drive straight out to the traffic signal and exit. And, and just so uh, for my uh, understanding, the, is, there's enough radius for the trucks to turn in? Yes, they don't have to do what's known as K-turns right. or anything like that. It's one maneuver, so it can be easily done. And on other retail centers with mixed-use parking, when we have you know truck and customer traffic, mm -hmm. we usually work with the operator to do the deliveries you know, in off hours early in the morning and not Saturday morning when there might be a peak. Right. And that's when they want to take their deliveries anyways because they don't want to be doing stocking at a busy time. I'm just making sure that there's enough radius to turn in without having to do the usual there backing is. There's up. There's both enough radius for the turn and there's, there's enough height for the trucks because they have to be taller. So there's a 14 foot clearance right. that's provided. Uh, I know that there was a lot of concern with some of the uh, residents that were on the back side of the lot. Uh, what were the results of the shadow study uh, that you conducted for the development site? Yeah, so the, the shadow study will have um, an impact um, in some of the seasons to the, the houses in the rear mostly. Um, it's less than one hour generally um, for one, of one house in the rear, it's a more than one hour, but less than two in the peak summertime. Um, and it's in the, in the afternoon, late afternoon to evening hours. And that was a reduction from the original study? So it was, however, I will say that, that the study that I'm talking about did have a seven story portion on Casina. Um, we should be getting back the five story proposal either today or tomorrow, and I'll be sure to send it to your offices. Please, thank you. Um, there was also concern about the grocery store. What are the proposed commercial uses uh, expected to be on site, and do you plan to include the grocery store? Yes, it, so, so we, um, we have committed to including a grocery store at, within this project. Um, how big the grocery store will ultimately be, I think that's still an open question, depending on who the operators are that come forward. We've already started active um, dialogue with multiple grocery operators, but um, that is something that we have committed to, to moving forward with the grocer. Um, to the extent that the grocer does not take up the entire low, um, ground level space, there would be an opportunity to bring in additional retail, and our focus there would be to include local businesses uh, within this project. I have two more questions and then I'm going to turn it over to Councilman McCoo. What is the bedroom mix of the proposed development? Yeah, so we have, um, we, we've laid out roughly percentage wise, um, studios would comprise about 5% of the project, about 35% would be one bedrooms, um, we had about 45% two bedrooms and then the balance would be threes. And what is your commitment to creating uh, prevailing wage jobs uh, on this site? We, com we committed to um, prevailing wage for the operations of the uh, residential portion of the project. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I now want to turn it over to Council Member Koo, uh, for questions. I forgot to turn on my mic, yeah. Thank you, Chair Moy. Yeah. So, um, Nick, right, you're the owner, you're, you're the manager of the company, right? I'm sorry? Uh, I, I forgot your last name, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I didn't hear. Okay. Your last name, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, my last name is Brown, yes. Okay. And I'm, I'm with, with Kimco, I'm here on behalf of Kimco, an employee of Kimco. You're, uh, you're here and on Kimco behalf of Kimco. Kimco is the owner, Kimco. yes. Yeah. 
So how long have you been managing the property? At Kimco, um, we've acquired the property roughly 10 years ago. Kimco acquired the property 10 years ago? Roughly, yes. That, oh. that's, that's around when we first acquired the property, yes. I thought it was longer than that. You said 60 years, no? Kimco has been in existence as a company for over 60 years. Um, this particular site we acquired roughly 10 years ago. So you, you have been actively managing the site for the last 10 years? Yes, Kimco has been, we, we, um, we serve as property management as well, and it's been about a 10 year period that we've been involved with this property. So uh, on, on your document here, you show us a, on the back side of this, uh, the property. Yes. Uh, it was uh, you know, very lousy, dirty, and everything, you know. So are you saying if you, this project, it doesn't move forward, you will keep the condition the same? Yeah, so the conditions that you're referring to, in many respects, you know, we, we have a lease certainly with all of our tenants, and the tenants are involved in bringing their trash out and um, coordinating the, the deliveries back and forth with the site. So throughout the lease, you know, we, we, are, we manage um, many aspects of the property, but as far as, you know, the trash, it, there's a trash removal process, but a lot of that falls within the tenant's responsibility as far as taking the, taking the trash out and how that's coordinated. We try to regulate that through the lease to make sure that that's done in, in a way that's appropriate, um, but that's an ongoing battle with tenants at any property is how they're managing their trash. And so what we've said is with this property, all of those issues as far as the back and forth and challenging between the landlord and the tenant and whether the tenant is complying and how well um, we're able to solve all that by making sure that that trash happens below ground. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying to you that no matter what is the result of today's uh, uh, public hearing, uh, I want you to improve the conditions in the back here, you know, because this is a problem. You know, the, uh, some doors are broken doors or no doors, and the trash all over the place. We, uh, as a management agent, you're supposed to be responsible for all this. We, we hear your concerns. Um, we could certainly try to do a better job with the tenants to make sure that they're adhering to the lease conditions um, and addressing the issues in the rear. And also, uh, on the last page, yeah, uh, talking about this positive benefit, right? Po and you mentioned uh, there will be community facility space. Uh, how can the community benefit uh, this community space? Uh, are you working with any nonprofit groups uh, to use this space as uh, uh, senior centers or activity centers or anything like that? Or what's your plan on that? Yeah, so the community facility space is, is an interesting one. You know, initially that was presented on the plans. Um, when we sat down with the community board, what we heard from them was that they were not interested in seeing any community facility space at all um, based on what their perceived traffic impacts would be. And they said, would you consider making that residential and not putting community facility space in? And we said, we're flexible, we're open to do whatever is the will of the people, if you will. Um, if you want us to take the community facility space off the plan and make it residential, we can do that. However, if it's um, your preference or the preference of the council, that something happened with the community facility space, we're certainly here to, to satisfy that as well. In specific response to your question, I think where um, a lot of the focus has been is, and, and you hit the nail on the head, it's really those two uses. It's um, non-for-profit space, whether that, that could be office, as well as um, a, a senior center. We started down that road. Um, that's something that we have additional work to do, and certainly within the next couple of weeks, that's gonna be a huge focus um, for us. We would love nothing more than to work closely with your office to identify who the appropriate parties would be to bring into that space, um, and that, that will certainly be our intention in the very short term. Thank you, yeah. So you, you briefly mentioned by, uh, you briefly mentioned the restrictive uh, decoration. Can you please explain the rest restrictive decoration in detail for the community uh, who is here today? Um, so we have uh, agreed to restrict the building um, to five stories in height. 
we've um, agreed to restrict the rear yard and uh, the side yards to eight feet um, from, to not to start from eight feet from the property line, so where um, the pointer is right now. Um, we've also moved the residential legs back in the rear from the required 30 feet, additional 15 feet for 45 feet. And additionally, we moved the, the um, northernmost rear leg from um, what was an originally uh, 30 feet from the residential properties to the north to 65 feet from the property line. Um, and I believe, yes, and the, and the restrictive declaration would be recorded against the property um, and it, you, no owner, whether it was us or an owner in the future, would be permitted to do anything but that. Okay. So how, you, how are you going to handle the increased um, traffic and increased pedestrian, uh, uh, pedestrian traffic, increased pedestrian traffic on Kisena Boulevard and, and on uh, Holly Avenue? Because Holly Avenue is very narrow, right? And, and the next one is very narrow too. And we have buses going, there, uh, going through there. So it's already very hard for two big cars to drive at simultaneously with the two sides parking. Um, so uh, with the increase of like uh, tenants to live there and commercial uh, p commercial uh, customers and, and residential neighborhood people, so you will create a, a much higher demand of the use of the roads. So how are we going to handle that? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, was, it was something that we spoke to the community about at length, um, and we think we came up with a great solution, which is this traffic plan. So um, first of all, originally when we came to um, you and the community with our plan, we had two, um, an egress and entrance on both closer to Holly and one closer to Laburnum. We removed the one closer to Holly, which is shown with the pointer right there, because of the traffic on Holly. Because if we had kept that, there could be long queuing that would back up onto Holly. So we removed that, and we put in turn lanes to allow for um, vehicles to turn in, which is away from Holly, into the site, um, and from Laburnum to, if you're going north, right into the site. The, the project itself has a 230 foot ramp to allow for many cars to queue into the parking. Um, and it also, these turning lanes and the removal of the um, existing parking spaces that are there now will allow the traffic to just keep passing on through and not back up because they're turning onto the site. Um, uh, additionally, you asked about pedestrians, I think one of um, the best things which uh, John mentioned that came out of this, our discussions, is the crosswalk um, at Calmia, <laughs> which will now have a light. So right now there's a crosswalk with no light. So you're kind of at your own risk when you cross. This light will allow and, and regulate pedestrians crossing onto the property. Additionally, pedestrians will no longer have to walk through the parking lot, which has also been a big problem. So they'll be able to walk right from the street into the building, get off the sidewalk, um, just like the vehicles are getting right off the street into the building. And we think that that will resolve um, a huge problem. And again, with these additional measures that we talked about with the community, our, our uh, traffic analysis company, uh, VHB, you know, they believe that the condition, once the project is built, will be better uh, once the project is built than it is today. Okay. All right, the last thing I want to say is that on your, on your polling map, your full support map, and then um, I, I think this is, uh, it doesn't, you, to my mind, this is not accurate because you, you have more support on, on the downtown side, okay. right? Uh, on the north of uh, Holly, north side. Uh, and then, not that much support from the local, but, but local, uh, uh, the local area is residential neighborhood. Of course, they have less people live there. 
Yeah. And on, on the other side is high rises. Uh, of course, the population is more there. But I am suspicious that you know, that many people on the other side uh, support this project. But since this is done by a lobbying company, you know, uh, they can manipulate the data or manipulate the people uh, a little bit. But on the residential neighborhood, uh, there's nobody help there to, uh, to do this. That's why you show uh, uh, a predominantly uh, supporting side on the other side. So I think this map is not, this polling is not accurate. You know? um, so that's why I want to say, I, I, I want to thank Chair Moyer for hosting this uh, public hearing. Uh, and we want to hear from the, uh, the public uh, to state their opinions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Ku. Thank you for uh, your testimony today. Uh, I'd like to call up the uh, next panel. Uh, I'd like to call up uh, Michael Madrid. Jasmine Javier La Rosa. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing the name. Udre Gutierrez and uh, Martha Flores Vasquez. We'll be translating for Audrey. Sure. So I just want to uh, remind everyone we have a lot of folks that want to testify, and we have a two-minute uh, time limit uh, on the on the clock. So uh, if you could just state your name, and then uh, you may begin. Buenos días, Presidente Lago, y miembro de la comisión. So before you start, hold on. Uh, can you just uh, make? Si puede eh, hablar en el micrófono, eh, nos ayuda. Okay, I'm sorry. Gracias. Okay. Gracias. Buenos días, mi nombre es Dre Gutiérrez. Buenos días, Presidente Lago y miembros de la Comisión. Me llamo Dre Gutiérrez. Yo trabajo como de mantenimiento y, y he estado afiliada en la 32BJ por casi dos años. Estoy aquí en calidad de residente de Flushing Queens y a nombre de la Unión para manifestar nuestro respaldo a la, al proyecto de desarrollo propuesto para el 4615 Quisena Boulevard. Como residente de Flushing, me siento contenta de testificar hoy en, en respaldo de este proyecto, puesto que traerá tan necesarias mejorías en el vecindario de las 182 unidades creadas en este proyecto. Una tercera parte será vivienda accesible. Necesitamos viviendas permanentes accesibles y permit, que permitan que los residentes actuales como yo podamos seguir formando parte de la comunidad. Este proyecto incluye asimismo otras inversiones que mejorarán la calidad de vida, tales como una tienda de comestibles moder modernizada, además de cambios para disminuir el tráfico. Como afili afiliada a la 32BJ, tengo el gusto de respaldar el proyecto debido al compromiso del constructor por crear empleos buenos y permanentes que pagarán salarios prevalecibles. Me siento orgullosa de respaldar este proyecto que les ofrecerá a mi, a mi vecino la oportunidad de tener un empleo tan bueno como el mío. La resonificación de Quisena Center es un em ejemplo de proyecto de desarrollo responsable que conllevan significativos beneficios para la comunidad. El equipo de este proyecto Está, presentado a, está presentando atención a la comunidad y se esfuerza para, seguir, para asegurarse de que Gracias. mejorará el vecindario de manera nos incluya a todos. Gracias. Gracias. Uh, I'm translating. 
Can you state your name? My name is Jasmine. On, I'm be speaking on behalf of 32 BJ. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Chair Lago and members of the commission. My name is Udri Gutierrez. I work as a maintenance worker and have been a member for 32J for 32 BJ for over two years. I am here today as a resident of Flushing, Queens, and on behalf of my union to express our support for the proposed project at 4615 Casino Boulevard. As a res resident of Flushing, I am happy to testify today in support of this project as it will bring much needed improvements to the neighborhood. Of the 182 units created by this project, one third will be affordable. We need permanently affordable housing that will be an opportunity for current residents like me to stay in the community. This project also includes other investments that will improve quality of life like an updated grocery store and changes to decrease traffic. As a union member, I am pleased to support this project because of the developer's commitment to create good, permanent jobs that pay the prevailing wage. I am proud to support a project that will give my neighbors a chance to have a good job like mine. The Casino Center rezoning is an example of responsible development that comes with significant community benefits. This development team is listening to the community and working to make sure the project improves the neighborhood in an inclusive way. At 32BJ, we see this project as an example of responsible development. We respectfully request that you approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, me? Yes, hi. My name is Michael Madrid. I am a longtime resident of New York City. Um, and I'm here on my own recognizance. I'll keep it brief. Uh, we have a housing crisis here in this country and in this city. Uh, you can blah, blah all you want about tenant protections, but the simple fact is if you do not have enough housing to meet the needs of the community, some people are gonna be having horrible commutes or they're gonna be living on their friend's floor or they are gonna be homeless. We need to build more housing. It's great to see some communities like Minneapolis recently approving um, rezoning, which allows more housing being built. We really, it'd be nice if we could do something like that here in New York City, but at the very least, we should be, at the very least, we should be approving reasonable projects like this. The um, objections I've heard for projects like this are density. I must confess, I don't really understand this one. We're here in New York City, one of the densest cities in the world. Manhattan is a lot denser than the area we're talking about. We're adding a modest amount of units. Um, you know, Manhattan is actually less dense than it was in 1910. That was a wonderful period for the city, helped build the city. If we asked density questions back when Manhattan was a lot of single houses, we would probably be a suburb of Jersey City right now. So that one I'm having hard with. Um, the other objection is this will destroy the traditional character of the neighborhood. Um, that longtime residents have come to, to love. Well, this is, you know, a city of constant change. I would ask those longtime residents. At some point, you were not longtime residents. You came here, you brought your energy, you did great things, and you've helped make this city the wonderful place it is. Please give this chance to new residents, build the housing they need, and let's continue to make New York City the vibrant city it has always been and one of the greatest cities in the world. Thank you. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to represent my district. I am Martha Flores Vasquez, co-leader with Peter Ku in Part B of the district where this development is taking place. Um, we are overdue for a bodega, a grocery store in my district, a supermarket. Everything is gone, the diversity of shopping is gone. And I came in here and I was asked if I was on Kimco's side and I'm on the community side. I have lived in Flushing for 40 years. I'm not a lobbyist, I'm a grassroots activist and advocate for the community. With all due respect to my constituents that are sitting over here and I love them from the bottom of my heart and I have been representing them and I will continue to represent them on this issue, but I feel that this is a good proposal. I have a few bullet points um, because I, I had my granddaughter. I figured I'd get ready to do this in a minute. I am asking the subcommittee and Councilman Ku to please support the rezoning to improve the Casino Shopping Center. The development will provide an improved supermarket and retail shops and a mix of affordable and market, and market rate apartments 
for our quickly growing community. We need new retail space for local businesses and a new improved grocery store with increased offerings would be very welcome. Affordable housing is greatly needed in our growing community and I am pleased that 30% of this project will be permanently reserved at below market rent. I also believe we need the economic investment that this project will bring in a previously ignored section of the neighborhood. For homeowners in the neighborhood, I believe this Im improvement will increase in property values for surrounding homes and businesses. I am also glad that this project will create about 200 construction jobs and support many dozens of permanent jobs. Once the center is complete, Casino Boulevard is an appropriate place for this kind of development. Thank you, and it's an honor to be here. And to my constituents, I'm still with you, thank but you. I think this is a good idea. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'd like to call up the next panel. Uh, the next panel, uh, Terrence Park, Jack Zhang, John Ha, and Wen Tao Zhao. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. So uh, let's begin with you, Terrence. If you could just state your name, and then you may begin. And we'll go. My name is Terrence Park. Uh, my name is uh, Jack Zhang. My name is Wen Tao Zhao. I'm John Ha. Yeah. So why don't we start there? Yeah. OK. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's just a special honor for me to speak out of my opinion here. I have lived in Flushing almost 20 years, and I have been doing business in this area over 13 years. My office is just one block away from this project. I love Flushing, and I want Flushing to develop responsibly and quickly. I strongly support Casino Center project for the following reason. First, the project will beautify this area. Most of the buildings in this area are over 60 years. Some are over 100 years. If you compare Google Maps 20 years ago with Google Maps now, I don't think you can see any difference. But during the same time, other parts of Flushing have undergone tremendous economic growth, spurred by commercial and residential development, which make this area a sharp contrast to the other parts. This area has been ignored for so long. Second. This project will provide 30% affordable housing, over 200 construction jobs, and some permanent jobs thereafter. Like most parts of New York, Flushing has affordable housing crisis, and more and more people are living in New York because they cannot afford ever rising rents. We need additional affordable homes this project will provide. In addition, many people living in Flushing, they are new immigrants. They need jobs. The project can create a win-win situation. The city can get a better than need affordable homes and a higher property tax. Local people can get jobs and increase the property value. The developer can make some profit. Some opponents to this project say they don't need jobs, affordable homes. Their idea, I think, is very selfish. Third, the project can attract more business investment and people to this area. Why is Flushing a special, dynamic, and booming city? Because it's a long history of welcoming new residents. Even when the economy was bad in other parts, Flushing was always good because it's a constant influx of new residents. As a small business owner, I think deeply, more people, more business. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank time. You. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Good morning, Councilman. My name is Wen Tao. Um, I'm here today to speak express my opinion in favor of the casino project as both a college student and a Flushing resident. First, I support this project because it can provide jobs and economy investment in Flushing. As a college student who will be looking for a job soon, I felt very sad when Amazon canceled their HQ2 plan. 
I know this project on Casino Boulevard would not be the same or not create the same job that the Amazon will have, but my point is that Queens cannot become a borough who says no to a good project and that will create job opportunities for everyone in the community. Second, I'm very familiar with this area. I lived there most of my life and the supermarket needs to be modernized. It would be better for uh, customers to enter the supermarket from the sidewalk instead of just walking through the parking lot and getting a potential or getting hit by the cars or trucks that is unloading and loading stuff in. Um, I'm glad this project will move the parking lot to the underground, which could create more safety for the kids and everyone in the community. And finally, this area has been ignored by the city for far too long. And I hope this project will be a good opportunity for everyone in the community to get developed and spur development into the whole area. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Honorable uh, Committee Chair Moya and Honorable City Council Member Peter Ku and distinguished uh, civic leaders, uh, good morning to all. Uh, my name is Terrence Park. Uh, I lived in Flushing for 47 and going to 48 years. I'm a community person. I serve as a community board seven member for 20 years and I love my community and I, I always has been standing up for the rights of entire community, not a portion of a segment in our community. Uh, I needed a courage to come forward today because I voted against the project and I changed my mind now and supporting the project, uh, which I go against the Community Board 7's decision and some civic association's desire for the project. Uh, after I speaking with many people in our community, I found out most striking uh, opinion in the community that is overwhelming, overwhelming individuals, residents in the community wants to have upgraded shopping mall. If there should be a shopping mall, they want to upgrade a shopping mall and they don't want to go all the way downtown flushing. It's too much traffic and it, it is a hassle to drive down there and therefore they want their community to get to access to upgrade a shopping mall and that was the major desire for the most residents that I spoke with. And now Kimco is willing to and continue to willing to listen to the community and the city council member and civic association leaders to downsize and meet the needs for the community. I believe the community should give a fair chance and the civic association leaders should give a fair chance to the Kimco to meet in the middle ground and give them opportunity to meet the needs of the community so we all can meet the common ground for the community. Thank you, Thank so you. I implore the committee to- Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Get over. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and the committee chair, and Peter Ku. Uh, it is my profound privilege and honor to be with you this morning to Im implore the possibility of your keen, considerate discretion on Kimpo project uh, in this uh, surrounding area of uh, development, particularly in the multicultural uh, neighborhood in Flushing Main Street. I understand that there are two civic groups against, against this uh, project, and it is imperative for you to understand two vital information with facts. First, they are not the major voices of the community. Second, they do not represent the entire surrounding neighbors of this beneficial product. The recent survey finds that 99% of the people in the said community won't see development because of the following reasons in two folds. First, they want the better and upgraded shopping mall, easy access and near to their homes, as indicated in the evidence of more than a thousand petition signatures from the people. Second, 
in addition to the aforementioned uh, statement, as Mr. Uh, uh, Brown stated, the Kimpo is adding a number of beneficial elements for the communities, such as more than 30% of affordable housing, economic investment of opportunities, increases in property values, local creation of uh, uh, the jobs during the construction, and afterwards, new retail spaces availabilities, new improved groceries availabilities. And uh, these are the vital facts that you have to consider for this uh, product. And th therefore, I'm uh, recommending this to you. Thank you. Uh, so that the uh, thank local people will benefit. Thank you so much thank for your you. testimony today. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm calling up the next panel. Um, Kevin Forestdale, Carl Marone, Denise Winters, Beverly McDermott, Thank you. We'll start. We'll start over here. If you can just state your name and you may begin. I'm Beverly McDermott. Sure. I'm Beverly McDermott, president of the Casino Park Civic Association and director of the Friends of, Cons of Casino Park. The Casino Park Civic Association has always been a strong proponent of any issue that affects the quality of life and character of our residential neighborhoods. To that end, we launched a downzoning program about 15 years ago to preserve the character and stabilize the skyline to conform with the one and two story homes we inhabit. The only exception was the commercial area on Casino Boulevard between 46th Avenue and Laburnum Avenue. Because the grocery market filled the needs of local residents and did not have a towering skyline. Zoning issues should not be taken for granted and should not be used as bargaining chips by developers or elected officials as taxpayers are then burdened with the results of bad decisions. It appears that the Kimco Corporation views the zoning issue as a mere stumbling block to defile our community with a building that does not fit the present context as prescribed by the zoning code with such a tall structure. The issues subsequent to such a change are numerous. Quality of life issues, such as traffic control, which would have an outreaching impact on the entire community, creating parking issues and redirected tra traffic into the surrounding streets, creating noise and pollution. The impact of such a tall structure and security wall to the immediate neighbors is appalling, cutting off the the light and the airflow. No one can guarantee how much noise will emanate from air conditioning equipment or the stench from numerous exhaust fans. Schools, public transportation, and hospitals in this area are already overwhelmed on their, in their efforts to provide for the community. And particularly, the schools are operating over their peak to the breaking point, as well as emergency rooms in the hospitals. Thank you so much All for right. your testimony. Um, may I read, uh, our zoning ch uh, chairman couldn't come today. And uh, you can submit that testimony. Everyone has uh, two minutes for, right, so for their testimony. I, we I need to move to the next one now. Right. Uh, but you can definitely submit that to us. Sorry, we have a long list of people also waiting to testify. You, you may begin. Okay. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Denise Winters, and I'm the president of the Holly Civic Association. Um, I strongly oppose the Kimco project for many reasons. Uh, first, it's for the safety. It's a big safety issue. The heavy traffic that exists right now on Casino Boulevard and Holly is so very congested. The buses cannot get up or down the avenue right now. 
The ambulances cannot get to the hospital fast enough. And they're very worried with this new project being built. Um, I sit on the board and they, they have expressed their concern on this. Um, the schools cannot hold the amount of children that will be going into this new project. Um, this is just a very bad accident waiting to happen. And what about the people who own homes in that vicinity? Um, the zoning is for one and two families. Is it fair to them who bought their homes knowing that this is a residential area? I mean, it, they pay taxes and they deserve the privacy of their own neighborhood. Um, please don't take this away from them. Thank you. Can you just make sure that you push the button? Yep, and it's on. The red light should go on. It's on, okay. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Carol Marone, and I'm vice president of the Holly Civic Association. Kim Co is here to make money no matter how badly it affects the neighborhood. Councilman Peter Ku has rejected this project. CB7 has rejected this project. And Borough President Melinda Katz has already rejected this proposal. Some of the reasons I oppose the Kimco project are PS21 is at 170% capacity right now. And the Kimco building will be adding many more children at a school that is already bulging at the seams. The building is not providing enough parking spaces and the overflow cars will be um, up and down um, all on the neighborhood streets. Um, Kimco affordable housing starts at $1,600 to $1,800. I want to know on what planet is that affordable? Um, if this building is built, it will set a precedent for all future construction south of Holly Avenue. Okay, one more. This project affects the quality of life in the neighborhood. This building will block the, the light, the sun, and air from reaching one and two family homes near it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, almost afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Kevin Forrestall, and I'm president of the Queens Civic Co Congress, an organization, and brother organization that represents over 100 civics in Queens. Um, I'm going to deviate from my remarks based upon what was said before. Uh, the applicants showed a slide and suggested looking north. Well, I suggest if you're looking for health care, you may want to look north, like in Northwell Health. But if you want to look at what the neighborhood looks like, look anywhere but north. If you do that, you will find low-density suburban-like uh, dwellings. And uh, th this area had been rezoned before to be contextual, and, and it this would strongly uh, threaten that and future uh, developments. Uh, Councilman Ku, you question where the line would be? This is the line where, where it should be. The applicant also spoke about uh, how wonderful they are in outreach to the neighbors and the community board and so on. Uh, they didn't mention that they were totally not convincing to any of those individuals or groups. They also spoke about how they downsized their project, and that's, there's a truth in that. They proposed an elephant. They, they suggested a replacement of a rhinoceros, and wh where would you expect a terrier? Um, also, Councilman Ku, you, you pointed out that there was an inaccuracy in the map. Uh, that's consistent with their evaluations of the, the environmental plan. Uh, a noted uh, city planner who reviewed it, the, the uh, environmental plan said that his finding of inconsistencies and <coughs> inaccuracies leads him to ca characterize the EAS as remarkably sloppy or intentionally misleading. Uh, council members, I think that the uh, presentation by Kimco was, could also be characterized that way or totally disingenuous. On behalf of the 100 members plus of the Queen's Civic Congress throughout all of Queens, we ask you to reject this application. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Th thank you for, uh, for all of you for your testimony. But did you have? No. Okay. 
Thank you so much. Uh, Billy Azorin, Yuan Wang, Hang uh, Hari, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, and then uh, I just have Sunny. Billy, you there? Hold on, I'm just oh, checking. Uh, Yuan, uh, Hang, Hari, okay. And Sunny? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right, Billy, let's start with you. All right. Um, is this thing on? Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Billy Azarin, and I'm just, I'm not a president. I'm not a board member. Nothing. I'm just a simple kid from Queens, and I'm advocating for this thing because I live around that area. And honestly, I'm looking for a job, and it's kind of hard to find a job when like the closest thing I have is not even available to me. So I, I hope that like when this thing does improve, it can offer a lot more jobs to people, especially in my high school, since we're all looking for jobs, but we have to go so far away when there's an available. Um, job site near us, but we can't because like there's nothing going on. And that's basically my advocate. Also, that job increase by 30% for all us kids because we're looking, as we said, like stress. We're looking for jobs, and also um, for traffic-wise, it can help out a lot because I take the 17, and trust me, that area is nasty, and I can't even get to school on time because of that. And also, um, Councilman Koo, um, you came to my school a couple years ago. Just want to say hello. <laughs> Billy, what high school do you go to? I go to Francis Lewis, but I recently just graduated, so. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you for coming here, and I'll let uh, Councilman McCoo explain his name. But. Well, let me everyone speak first. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, subcommittee and uh, uh, Councilman Koo. Um, my name is Yuan Wang. Uh, like this young gentleman here, I'm not representing any uh, board or any organization. I'm just a uh, local resident and a homeowner. Um, I support this uh, project. Uh, I have a couple of reasons. First, I want to uh, say I understand uh, people who are against this project, uh, mainly, okay, uh, about two things. Too many people and uh, too much traffic. Uh, regarding the first one, too many people. I should, I would say this is a kind of a testimony that people use their uh, feet to vote. Uh, this is, people approve. This is a, a, a welcoming and a, a desirable area to live. So that's why people move in. So apparently uh, we have a, a housing shortage. Uh, this project will provide some relief, uh, not totally solve the problem, but it, at least it's a heading toward the right direction. The secondly, the, the, the traffic. Uh, the traffic today is pretty bad already. Uh, I understand that. Um, however, I will say uh, the traffic doesn't bother me much because I shop locally, I buy everything possible, I shop locally, I, I walk. Walk is good for you, uh, for your health. Uh, if you cannot walk, uh, take public transportation. Um, so um, I, in the future, once the, the, the shopping center is built, okay, uh, hopefully uh, you can meet your shopping requirement. Uh, you do all the business uh, locally. Uh, support the local, local business is good for the community. Uh, that's the message I would like to say, uh, so I support the project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, councilmen and uh, council members. I'm coming here today to support this project. I've been living there for several years, and I'm very familiar with this area. I think that the supermarket should be modernized. When I go to shopping, 
I'm very concerned because of the trucks and the cars driving in the front of the supermarket may hit children. It is very dangerous. So I support this project and hope they will move the parking lot on the ground. It is safer for small children and shoppers. Most of my neighbors also support this project, but they cannot come today because they will go to work. Casino Blower is, is a proper place for this development. We should take advantage of opportunities to improve this portion of the neighborhood. Thank you very much. Hi. Good afternoon, uh, Supper Committee and Councilman. My name is Peng Heng. I am a housewife and a long-time resident who has lived in this proposal Kisina shopping center neighborhood. I have been doing grocery shopping with the Grow City supermarket, and it's predecessor for many 20 years. My family also frequently deem in the many restaurants nearby. I support the resident project because the current shopping center is now very out of date and over capacity. It is out of date because store owner failed uh, making update, upkeep keep its over capacity because this neighborhood has experienced so much growing. The, re the rezoning project address both the need of improved shopping and the housing space. In addition, the project also provides jobs to this community. This is a project that is beneficial to the community. For all these reasons, I strongly support the rezoning project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, testimony today. Uh, I'd like to call up the next panel, uh, Dorothy Wu, uh, Karsten Glazer, uh, Catherine Kennedy, and Eddie Abrams. Uh, you'll forgive me that I will be stepping out briefly uh, next door to check into my other committee that I have. Uh, Council Member Koo uh, will take over to conduct uh, the meeting in my absence, but I will come back in a few minutes. Uh, I will now turn it over to Council Member Koo. Thank you. Uh, please go ahead and by staying your name first. Gustavo yeah, Woody, yeah. Uh, my name is Eddie Abrams. I'm a member of the Holly Civic Association. I'm, uh, I'm in a way, I'm very upset. I'm a union person for years. I've worked hard all my life with my family and my wife that we, to buy what I have. I have a nice home. I'm very happy where I live. I'm not accepting this zoning. And as far as these uh, workers will see, that it's not always gonna be they get a good paying job. These people, uh, the, pe the people here that live around here, they're in transit. They're, they are not gonna stay here. If you get your education and you, uh, and you make a lot of money, you're gonna leave this place. There's, not, they, there's no transit. The, 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 the union people should realize that, that they got a good job if they're getting the wage that they're supposed to get it. And I doubt whether they are getting paid good. And that's why they got a little uh, thing going here now about uh, something about their money. You know, I don't know. But I'm uh, living in Flushing for, sev for 70 years. I bought my house when I was 50 years ago. 
and it was an, a place where I was going to live my life, and I want to leave something for my family when I go, or go away. So this is, uh, this, you know, I'm not happy with this at all. It's really, I'm very upset and I'm sorry. I, I don't, you know. I'm Kathleen Kennedy from the Casino Park Civic Association Board. Over the years, the federal government made promises and treaties with local inhabitants. And over the years, every treaty with Native Americans has been broken when it was made clear that a profit could be made. And now our city government is considering breaking the zoning promise made to Flushing residents because someone discovered he could make a profit. When the zoning laws were enacted, Flushing residents were promised that south of Holly Avenue to the Long Island Expressway would remain low density residential. It's what the residents wanted then and still want. Our homes have appreciated in value because of our low density status and many are now worth a million dollars or more. In what other city can you imagine the government telling owners of million dollar homes that it will be acceptable to plop a high rise apartment building in their midst and that they should be happy to have an 85 foot wall abutting their backyard? If the residents living south of Holly Avenue wanted to live in a high density area, we would have moved to downtown Flushing or Manhattan. Kimco's claim that they can solve the traffic problems by adding three to 400 parking spaces for more traffic is laughable. The relocation of traffic lights can be accomplished without rezoning and the supermarket can be modernized without adding a high rise apartment. The claim that it will add neighborhood jobs is specious. Local people already have jobs to support their million dollar homes and the jobs are only going to be for outsiders and they are going to be only as long as construction goes on. The claim that there's low, co low cost housing has some truth, but to allow that by rezoning Casino Boulevard is to penalize the local residents to provide housing for folks who don't live here. It's punitive to grant this rezoning. I also understand that a CB7 member has been p doing a petition in favor of Kimco, and I respectfully suggest that all signers of that petition be verified and that signatures of people who don't live south of Holly be discounted because they don't have any stake in this rezoning proposition. Thank you very much. Council Member uh, Koo, Karsten Glazer, Casino Park Civic Association. I submit testimony and I read testimony today on behalf of our uh, planning consultant who could not be here. Um, to be brief, one of the modest change, even the modest change by the CPC from R7A to R6A, which will lower the maximum heights of the proposed development by a single story or 10 feet, and a decrease in the allowable floor area from 4.6 to 3.6, the resulting development will still be grossly out of character with the surrounding community of primarily detached and semi-attached one to two family houses. There's no question that should it be approved by city council. The precedent will be set by this action, will significantly shift the long delineated boundary be between high density precincts of downtown Flushing and low density Holly and Casino Park neighborhoods. Holly Avenue the casino, at Casino Boulevard has never been considered part of downtown Flushing. In fact, a detailed examination of the zoning actions uh, since the establishment of 1961 zoning resolution reveals that there have been only two upzoning amendments since in the immediate area that could be described as moving the boundary of the high density zoning uh, uh, south of 45th Avenue. One occurred in December 7 in 1967 from R32 to R6 and again in 1994 also R32 um, from R32 to R36. Unlike the current proposed rezoning, both of the previous actions essentially legalized existing high density buildings, not creating opportunities for significant out of scale development schemes as we're seeing with Kimco. As discussed in previous testimony along Casino Boulevard, there is a clear division 
both zoning and visual between existing high density development north of Holly and low density development south of Holly. Maps and figures have been submitted. In conclusion, the applicant should be denied on three points. The lack of merits and public interest behind the, proposing, uh, the proposed rezoning, the negative effects that the proposed zoning will have on the immediate neighborhood, the purposefully misleading and inaccurate renderings and data within the EAS proffered by the developer as described in the previous testimony, and the precedent that it will set for expansion of high density development into low density communities far below Holly Avenue. And I thank you. My name is Dorothy Wu, uh, a member of a Holly Civic Association, and I oppose the, this application. My major concern about this application is the traffic uh, conditions uh, it will cause on the surrounding streets. Through my window, I can often see buses and the cars backed up for a few blocks due to the traffic uh, disruption either on Casino Boulevard or on Holly Avenue. These streets are just too narrow to handle such a high volume of uh, traffic. My property, which is adjacent to the Cape Co Shopping Center, is also located on the same block with uh, commercial establishments, which is also included in this proposal. Their activities directly affect my quality of life. Uh, I, I would like to, uh, what I imply uh, the here, I could, uh, I have a wish list. I wish this um, business be family friendly. No nightclub, no karaoke, and the garbage bin are placed behind the premises according to the sanitation rule and the quiet ventilation equipment is stored. I would like to request your, uh, re reconsider uh, your June 3rd uh, decision on the approval of Kinko's um, uh, application. It resulted uh, in the amendment of Zuni map which was based on one favorable environmental study. I believe before the amendment of a zoning map become permanent, it needs to be feasibility study as well as a, a comprehensive traffic study. Uh, spot zoning in favor of a particular property owner is a bad example, and it is also unfair to the adjacent property owners. Their property value needs to be protected too. I suggest the Kinko seek a variance for their development instead of a request for change of zoning. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, the next panel will be Brandon Levy Stephen Smith, Amy Wu, and Yi Chen. Starting from my left side, my left side, please state your name and you may begin. Uh, Stephen Smith. Are we all saying our names or, yeah? Sh should I begin? Yeah, okay. Uh, my name is Stephen Smith. I'm here on behalf of Open New York, a group that advocates for building more housing in high opportunity neighborhoods in and around New York. Uh, this city has a dire housing crisis and it affects not only Manhattan and gentrifying neighborhoods in Brooklyn and Queens, but also more outlying neighborhoods where immigrants struggle to pay the rent in overcrowded apartments. Uh, I know many speakers in this room own their own homes. I know a lady spoke earlier pretty disgustingly about million dollar homes uh, and don't struggle with housing, but New York's housing crisis is truly citywide. Um, I wanted to tell a personal story about my connection to Eastern Queens. My great aunt Sylvia uh, recently moved to a nursing home, but for 50 years before that, she lived in Northeastern Queens in the same apartment. I learned a lot about her life after she moved to New York. 
She and her brother, my grandfather, were born in the Bronx. My aunt Sylvia married a school teacher in Queens and moved from an apartment, and moved from apartment to apartment before settling on a three bedroom apartment uh, a bit to the east of downtown Flushing. In that three bedroom apartment, they had room to take care of my aunt's mother, who lived there uh, after her husband passed away, just as many immigrants today live in multi-generational households. My aunt stopped working after she got married and they could afford it on just a school teacher's salary, something that would have been unimaginable today. How is it possible when so many people today in the same situation are crowded into studios in one bedroom apartments with adults sleeping in bunk beds and on couches? It was possible because back then, Queens made room for people who wanted to move there. My aunt lived in a series of six-story red brick apartment buildings of the kind found throughout Eastern Queens. The building she moved into was built in 1968 and she stayed in it for 50 years uh, until she uh, moved to a nursing home. Today, we don't allow this. The 1961 zoning code severely restricted these kinds of buildings and today, uh, the only buildings that are allowed of this scale are allowed in downtown Flushing, a few blocks around uh, Roosevelt and Main Street and in, increasingly in downtown Jamaica. People in the rest of Eastern Queens have to crowd into buildings built 100 or 100 or 50 years ago, back when Queens, back before Flushing became the gateway between the world's largest economy and the world's largest country. The result is skyrocketing housing prices. Um, I know most city council members identify as progressives. I hope you'll vote for progress today, for more homes so that immigrants who come to this country today can have the same privileges and opportunities uh, in Queens as my family had half a century ago, uh, and uh, indeed many project opponents had. Uh, Eastern Queens needs a lot more housing than this project can provide, but it's a start. I hope you'll vote in favor of it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, please uh, observe the two limit uh, time. Yeah. Uh, Brendan Levy from the Queens Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we're voting in support of the Casino Center. Uh, Councilman Ku and uh, committee members. I'm the business development manager at the Queens Chamber. I'm testifying to support the rezoning of the Casino Center, which will allow for the revitalization of an outdated retail complex. The new proposed development will create modern spaces for Queens retail businesses to operate from, add substantial parking, and provide an extensive number of temporary construction jobs as well as many permanent jobs in the new res residential portion of the building. The owner, Kim Co, has demonstrated its commitment to the neighborhood by not simply looking to build a new mixed-use building, but by thoroughly engaging traffic consultants who have given expert advice on alleviating traffic pressure into and out of the complex. As a borough, we need to encourage investment and revitalization of retail complexes such as this one on Casino Boulevard. We support sensible development that creates jobs and adds opportunities to the residents of Queens. We're happy to support the plans of this applicant to do so. We're, we're in favor of the project. Yeah, please. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Amy Wu. Um, my family own lot one and lot five on the tax map on the corner of Casino and Holly. Um, we, we support the rezoning because, um, first of all, we own lot five for over 10 years and um, our neighborhood needs major improvement and uh, new retail spaces for the local business to serve the growing needs of the uh, community. Um, we can have, you know, uh, banks or pharmacies that come in, but we need more retail space for them to come in. And we could have better looking and more fancy looking, perhaps, uh, retail space for them. And please uh, keep in mind the needs of the younger generation. I'm sorry that the local civic groups may not have considered the needs of and the housing problem. And I really hope you, you, you know, uh, that could be put into consideration. And um, I believe all these changes will benefit them in the long run and also the people in the neighborhood and also create jobs for the people in the neighborhood. And on our property, on our location, we do hope to provide at least 40 parkings in the future. So I hope that helps too. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Ku and everybody. My name is Yi Chen. I'm the property owner cross street from the property from Kinko. I come here to support this project rezoning because we like to see the more new style of the shopping center in Flushing, like a Chelsea market in Manhattan is so clean and nice. I think Flushing need a change and the shopping 
area environmental need change. I hope after this rezoning, area going to be more cleaner and more good for the community. Thank you. Thank you. The next panel will be Jenny Wang, Pauline La, Roland Wei, Edward Chin. Yeah, please identify yourself and then you can start, yeah. Hi, good afternoon. The mic, you can move this closer to you. Move, move, yeah, yeah. Closely? Yeah, no, no, move it closer to your, to your mouth, yeah. Okay. Oh, it's okay. Hi. That's fine, right? Okay. Hi, good, good afternoon. My name is Jenny Wen. Um, it's the homeowner of the 46-30 Union Street. It's right behind the, you know, Gold City Supermarket. So I came here is against the Kimco project due to the quality of life. Thank you. Uh, my name is Pauline, Pauline Na. Uh, I'm saying uh, it's a homeowner and it, uh, it's 46-26 Union Street. Uh, Jenny is my neighbor and it's the same condition. I live uh, right next to their Kimco, their, their project. And uh, they can modify their shopping center, make them better and cleaner, everything, but not make a five stories, uh, like a mixed use buildings. It will block the area, block the air, block the sun. Make, they say they can handle and uh, manage them uh, but for the past 10 years, they be managed them. It's pretty bad. Uh, I don't know how they can manage them. The, the more, more people, uh, the higher building, the more people come in, they will make a big mess. That's what I say. That's what I'm against the project. Uh, Councilman Ku and, and fellow Councilman, my name is Roland Wade. I am a professional horticulturist. I've lived on uh, Geranium and 45th Avenue for over 50 years and have taught and been at the Botanical Garden during this time. My concern is that the lines have been drawn. As Councilman Ku stated, 45th Avenue is the line north of 45th, the high rises go. South of 45th, they do not go. And that is true of Holly Avenue. North of Holly Avenue, off Casina, the high rises can go north the high rises do not go. Kimco has asked to change the zoning in this area north of, I mean, south of Holly Avenue. And I say the lines must stay, the zoning must stay as is. The lines have been drawn. They can work within their zoning uh, tenures and therefore I say keep it as it is but improve the area. Now I want to say something about Flushing. It is the birthplace of American horticulture. It goes back to 1737 with the Prince Nursery. It goes back to 1837 with the Parsons Nursery. The trees along, I mean the streets along Casino Boulevard are named for trees, alphabetically, ash, beech, cherry, and it goes to holly, H, and it goes to calmia and laburnum and so on. It is time that we say, this is the place that must remain beautiful. And you cannot remain beautiful by tearing down homes and changing zones as we have in Flushing. Thank you very much.
I can start. Uh, hi, my name is Edward Chin. I'm a homeowner at, on Casino Boulevard. I'd um, like to provide testimony in opposition to the proposal to rezone. At the March 28th, 2019 public hearing held at the Queensboro President's Conference Room, it was noted that Kimco had not yet obtained a DOT traffic study or whether the DOT would accept their proposed mitigation of the traffic concerns. There's an addition, of, their proposal is an addition of a traffic light at Calmia, which is less than 500 feet from the traffic light that's at Laburnum and Casino. Community Board 7 and Queensboro President's Office had documented many other concerns, including those voiced by the Holly Civic and Casino Park Civic Associations. Council Member Peter Cruz's office has received many calls expressing opposition to the proposed project. In the interest of time, I will refer you to their findings and recommendations. The proposed eight-story mixed-use building now changed to five stories as an R6A C2-3 would literally cross the line, that is Holly Avenue, in terms of what would fit the profile of the community. A total of 114 proposed apartments with its accompanying occupants would drastically create a bottleneck for those traveling north to downtown Flushing or south to the Long Island Expressway on Casino Boulevard. In reviewing the materials for the hearing, I was surprised that the City Planning Commission vote to approve the project. Of note, the City Planning Commission does not document any opposition to the proposed project nor during a 30-day public comment period. The president of the Holly Civic Association confirms that there was no notice of the CPC meetings. Public comment is essential to the decision making of the CPC. I live approximately 300 feet from the proposed project. No one has surveyed my, surveyed myself or any of my neighbors concerning whether they like or don't like the project. Thank you for the opportunity to provide my comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Koo, for um, taking over, and thank you all for your testimony here today. Um, okay. So we are coming down to the last two panels, and I'd like to call uh, Jack uh, Tuang. Uh, my name is Jack Tuang. I'm the property manager for the property on 4601 Casino Boulevard. Um, I'm not going to repeat what everybody say. I mean, it's quite obvious it does more good than harm. Um, I want to address the issue about um, one of the major issues, which is uh, traffic. I'll use Skyview as an example. I mean, Skyview, when you look at it, it brings a lot of joy and happiness to many families, and but yet it causes a lot of traffic if you try to cross College Point Boulevard, it's like nearly impossible and with the cars, so many cars and so many pedestrians trying to cross at the same time, I mean there's an easy fix and what do they do over there? They hire two crossing guards and it's, it's no problem. Traffic is it's smooth, it's fine. Uh, you just put one on every corner, two traffic guards, one on each corner and the salute, that that's your solution. But with this project, there's doing more people are benefiting then, I mean, yeah, we're gonna have to sacrifice a few people, but we're helping a lot more. So I hope you, um, the committee would um, agree with this. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. Uh, and now I'd like to call up Doreen uh, Bart Bartnikowski. Sorry, I hope I said that right. It's just you. You have the whole floor to yourself. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Doreen Bartnikowski. I am a property owner um, in, on uh, Laburnum Avenue and have been a property owner for 25 years. My mother lived on uh, Casina and Quince and had been a property owner for 25 years as well. I have two kids that are in their 20s and they are already talking about living in Flushing. We love the area. We love that it's low density. It is a beautiful low density area. I myself have worked in the area. 
I've worked in that um, area before, um, when it was Mandy's, years before Kimco uh, took over. Um, I'd like to say shame on Kimco for owning the property for 10 years and not dealing with the issues that they have now. Um, and their only resolution is to build a bigger property, making more problems. Um, I'd like to ask that um, if you can guarantee that in three months from now, will we be here again to hear a rezoning for across the street or for one block over? I ask you to please hold the line. It is a beautiful, low density area. I've purchased in that area because of the beautiful area that it looks. I have also want you to know that the bus lines that are there, I have taken the bus lines to go to Main Street. My husband has taken it to work at, to go to school at Queens College. My kids have taken the bus lines. They are already congested and cannot afford more people taking those bus lines. There are three bus lines right in front of Kimco. There is four bus lines on Holly and they are jam packed. Kids are late for school because they cannot get to where they need to go because of the congestion already in the area. And that is it, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your testimony today. Um, are there any other members of the public uh, who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing on this application uh, and it will be laid over. Let me just turn it over to I just want to say uh, thank you to all uh, coming to this public hearing. Uh, no matter you are against it or for it, this, is, this shows your concern, your love, your neighborhood. This is how democracy works. You come out and express your opinion, and then uh, we will decide on the merits of it. Thank you. Th thank you, Councilman Raku, uh, and to your staff. Uh, we're, excuse me, if we can just have some quiet, please. Have some quiet, please. Uh, please note that LU number 438, which was heard uh, today, will be laid over. Uh, and this uh, concludes today's meeting. I would like to thank the members of the public, uh, my colleagues, uh, Councilman Raku uh, and Councilman Raku's staff. Uh, but in particular, I'd like to thank the council uh, land use staff uh, for their amazing work that they always do. Uh, and my co-pilot here, Arthur, um, for keeping us uh, on track. Uh, thank you very much, and this meeting is uh, hereby adjourned.